Ladies and gentlemen, the play's the thing. With your host, Judy Sleed. Today's special guest, Konstantin Sukovetsky, world fame pianist. Now here's Judy, Judy, Judy. Thank you, Lee. Hello and welcome to the Plays the Thing. I have a wonderful playmate today, <laughs> Constantine. How are you? Excellent. Thank you, Judy, for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming to my show. And I'm so sorry we don't have a piano so I could show you off to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is something to look forward to, huh? Yes, next time you come, you bring your piano I'll with you. I'll bring my own piano, yeah, <laughs> yes. I'll wheel it. <laughs> yes. Well, I've been wanting to have you here for such a long time, and, uh, you know, circumstances <laughs> prevented it. And uh, I'm happy to be here. I was looking forward to it. And uh, I, I just want, I have this one flyer here, if you get a close-up. This was a performance that I went to that was last week in Montauk and as you could see he is the star and he played beautifully for an hour and a half and he got a standing ovation. He's got just marvelous fingers <laughs> on the piano. Thank you. Well it was a wonderful uh, concert for me to play for music from Montauk because it was the first time that I played for that uh, venerable organization that's been around for 20 years. It's been their 20th anniversary gala, you know, performance. And so it was kind of a huge honor for me to be asked to do it. Um, and they have such a wonderful audience. And a lot of the people are living in Montauk. So that is um, sort of their, you know, chapel of music to go yes, worship. Yes, so they were lucky to have you. <laughs> I was lucky to be there. Yes. So how long uh, have you been taking lessons or when did you start I should say well a long time ago I started playing piano you know my bio says when I was four because mm. I feel that saying that it was before is kind of embarrassing actually uh, the was truth it? of the matter <laughs> I think it was I think technically I mean I, I think I started playing the piano um, years uh, I mean it couldn't have been years obviously before I was four but I think just as, as early as I could walk over to it. I don't remember myself not being uh, a concert pianist. You know, my entire life, my consciousness uh, of, uh, of myself is that of a professional concert pianist. You said as long as, as soon as you were able to walk to the piano, I would say as long as your fingers could touch the keys. <laughs> well, you know, I think my grandfather <laughs> actually had me sitting on his lap and I was like, oh. you know, uh, going at it. See, my whole family are artists, but they're not uh, performing artists, they're visual artists, they're painters. My mm -hmm. mother, my father, my sister, my uh, grand aunts and uncles were painters. My grandmother danced with the Bolshoi Company, but then when she retired from the stage as a ballerina, she became uh, a books illustrator. So everyone paints professionally. So when I was born, they wanted me to be a painter. I, was, uh -huh. I have a younger sister who is a painter. She really had no choice. Uh, <laughs> whereas I, you know, they were so glad that you know the firstborn son is going to take over the dynasty, yes. and uh, and I sort of turned out to be well. I hope not a disappointment, but certainly not a painter. So, but I mean, I'm so glad you're not a painter <laughs> because am you're. Am I glad <laughs> I'm not a painter? Um, but you know, my granddad apparently was the one who uh, sort of was encouraging my. Uh, magnetism towards the piano because we had a piano at home and my grandmother played my mother played you know their moonlight sonata and uh and apparently as a kid as a child i just wanted to be around piano all the time i was like you know playing something on the keyboard until somebody said you know you really have to um show him to a teacher uh, yeah. because there might be something there <laughs> All of that I know from sort of myths because I uh, don't remember any of it. Uh, I my earliest earliest memories of myself is going to music special music school at the Moscow Conservatory and you know practicing pathetic 
or something. So. Um, well, I think it's fair to tell everybody that you were not born in the United States. <laughs> yes, it's fair. Uh, I was born in Moscow. Moscow. I mean, Moscow, That's Russia. Russia. Yes. Здравствуйте, добрый день. Я не знал, что говорить по-русски. Прекрасно. No. Uh, well, that was for our Russian-speaking yes. uh, audience. Yes. Uh, uh, добрый день всем. Uh, but this is, um, yeah, I was born, at the, you know, I lived through the last decade of Soviet Union. I was born in 81 and in 91 it all came to an end overnight. Uh, oh. So I watched it. Uh, I watched the Soviet flag pull down and the Russian flag go up. And uh, oh. my mother bursting in tears. I was happiness. just going to ask you how it affected you. <laughs> well, you know, it affected everyone's lives in a way. You can never, you can never predict how such changes will affect you because people wanted uh, freedom so much. Yeah. Uh, I remember feeling that any moment something major will happen, you know, a revolution or a mutiny or an uprising or something. It was mm -hmm. just in the air. So historically, it was a ripe moment for that to occur. But the country was not ready for, for that kind of freedom because it went directly from 72 years of very strictly dictated regime, if you will, a dictatorship mm -hmm. of communism to uh, anarchy of, you know, free-for-all capitalism overnight. And so there were lots of inherent problems in that. So the 90s were dark times. They were happy ideologically because people, you know, didn't have to, uh, you know, bow to the portraits of Lenin every day, which is what we had to, to do. they didn't have to be afraid. They didn't have to be afraid, but they also didn't have jobs and, and mm -hmm. money to pay their electricity bills with. I remember... Um, you know, having our apartment and our country house go, uh, house, uh, go dark uh, for mm -hmm. a while because there was just, it was difficult. And uh, when did you, did you learn to speak English while you were in Russia? Right, yes, I, I did. You did? <laughs> I, um, I was always obsessed with, with Hollywood movies. And, oh. I always, <laughs> and I always wanted to live in America. I just had this obsession, literally, with, with America. And, and Hollywood. And Hollywood. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I made up my mind I was going to live in America and that my life is going to be just like in the movies, you know. Yes. I, um, I must have been about 15 or 14 mm -hmm. when I decided that. And never having been to America just by watching the movies. <laughs> and I, um, I started watching uh, lots of movies where in the 90s, you know, we didn't have uh, licensed videos which would be subtitled or dubbed over. We had a pirated versions. Now, oh. now I realize that what we had was, was, you know, was literally fallen off the truck frequently <laughs> to Academy of, uh, Awards voters because it had a thing running under the picture. This is not for public viewing. This is, you know, mm -hmm. for Academy Awards or, or I don't know, daytime Emmy, uh, you know, uh, yes. screening, whatever. <laughs> so those were a lot of these movies came from the black market, which were then dubbed over by this person. Mm -hmm. This one guy became iconic voice because he was dubbing over everybody, all the actors. He was reading all the lines. In oh. a changed voice, which was like this, you know, it was oh. like monotone, crazy, <laughs> congested sounding, annoying sound. And it was delayed because he was speaking not in sync with the <laughs> actors. So technically speaking, it's a disastrous way of watching yeah, a movie. Yeah, but you still liked it. <laughs> but from, for me, it was an amazing way of watching the movie because you heard an English text and you heard immediately the translation of it. So you could process both. That is how I learned English, actually, because I heard what the actors said in the original voice, you know, with original intonation yeah. and accent. And then I heard what it meant in Russian. So after watching, you know, thousands yeah. and thousands of hours of movies, I began to understand, because, you know, there are patterns of speech. So it's funny, because yeah. when I came to America, I, I spoke in, in these kind of movie lines and riddles, because I <laughs> compiled my speech out yes. of all these, you know, I'll be back and, uh, yes. you know, help us Obi-Wan Kenobi <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Um, oh. Wonderful lines from all the movies yeah. that I watched. That is just so funny. Uh, 
And for a while, people were really amused by it. And then, of course, when I came to Juilliard, actually, they made all the international students take a year of English, which was very helpful, because that is when I, for the first time, formally studied English, and I learned the grammar, and I kind of, you know, became aware of past tense. Well, your English is excellent. Thank you. There is a new... You don't have an accent, or if you have, I don't hear it. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm try I think today's my good accent day. Uh -huh. But um, I was always interested in accents, clearly, because of my fascination with movies. But I you know, also acted. I acted in a theater in, in Moscow. Well, that's what you told me last time when I spoke to you, that uh, when I commented on your English, that it's because you're a good actor. Well, whether or not I'm a good actor, only well, time will show, but, but I'm very aware of diction and accents, uh -huh. and, uh, and I worked on it to uh, sound to, as, yeah. you know, accent-free as I can. So let's uh, talk about the Piano Fest. I mean, that's your forte. Absolutely. Came to Piano Fest for the first time when I was um, just coming out of my freshman year at Juilliard, and it was year 2000. And my teacher at Juilliard, a great American pianist, Jerome Lowenthal, Jerry Lowenthal is here, yeah. <laughs> known among colleagues, who was a faculty at Piano Fest for years and is a closest friend of Paul Shanley, who runs Piano Fest, who started Piano Fest, really. You're talking about Piano Fest here in the Hamptons. Yeah, here in the Hamptons. Hamptons. Piano Fest yes. in the Hamptons. <laughs> and um, so Mr. Lowenthal said, I think you will enjoy meeting Paul Shanley, and I think you will have a very good time at Piano Fest in the Hamptons. And I didn't know really anything at that point. I was really just one year in the country. So, uh, but I've heard from students that they all had a great time. So I said, sure, you know, I would love to. And then I auditioned for Mr. Shanley and um, came to Piano Fest. Um, and um, then I auditioned for Mr. Shanley and came to Piano Fest, and sort of the rest is history. The rest um, is history. Well, I came back to Piano Fest uh, for six consecutive years as a student, and really, uh, I've made so many mo important friends in my life um, through Piano Fest that I met here in the Hamptons that have heard me. But we really have become sort of, you know, like a. Uh, colleagues, friends. Colleagues and friends among the students, among the audience, among everyone who knows and comes to Piano Fest, that I feel really like it's my home. And I was exceedingly happy when this year uh, Mr. Shanley asked me if I would like to be an artist in residence at Piano Fest, which made my uh, sort of dream. Uh, come true of turning it into a reality television show. A reality television. Yes, when I first met you, you were filming something. Yeah, because what, since I was a student at Piano Fest, and it was exactly when the reality television was really beginning to become the cultural phenomenon that it is today. And um, I thought, you know, this is it. This is perfect. Because it's a house in East Hampton. There are 12 pianists, young, you know, brilliant, uh, very talented people uh, with ambition who are living together for the summer, for eight weeks, in one house where there's a Grand Steinway in every room, including kitchen. Wow, every room. And they have to <laughs> survive together, negotiate the practicing schedule, the rotation. They have to, uh, you know, eat together, all the meals are taken together, and and it's not competitive. So it's really, you know, you have to really get to know your colleagues in a way very intimately. Plus, there are only two bathrooms to be shared among, you know, so I mean, there are hilarious setups, and there are so many stories. I mean, there are so many just funny domestic incidences, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, somebody is coming back from the beach and taking a shower with, you know, sand everywhere, and then yeah. clogs, <laughs> and then we have a major, you know, bathroom disaster mm -hmm. on the eve of a concert, where yeah. the bathrooms are vitally important mm -hmm. for everyone to, you know, go put themselves together before mm -hmm. they go on stage. So, I mean, all these things lend themselves perfectly for a kind of a 
house reality TV. It's not a competition. It is uh, a place. So that's what you're working on. And that is what we've shot this summer. I'm mm -hmm. working on it. It looks hilarious. It looks great. Um, it's, it's pilot season of The Real Pianist of the Hamptons is in the working. And, so um, where, will, where can anybody see that? Well, we of course have our own YouTube channel and we have our own uh, Facebook page. And oh. hopefully all the local channels, I would be very happy if they wanted to, want to, to uh, sure. show it. And, uh, yes. and I, would like to, uh, I would like to meet with, uh, you know, Andy Cohen would be perfect because he oh, yeah. is the, um, he's the king of reality television. He kind of, you know, mm -hmm. is an inventor of the Real Housewives franchise, which uh -huh. is phenomenally successful. And, uh, uh, I and I really think this could be perfect addition to this because this also is very revolutionary. It takes classical music. And without changing the content, without, you know, crossing over musically, it crosses over culturally by presenting classical music and classical musicians in this very hip and sexy and unorthodox way. This is the ultimate behind the scenes. This is the voyeur, uh, you know, guilty pleasure to see how pianists and Do you have a name for live. that when you well, present it? Well, the a, so I mean, far name, our title is The Real Pianist of the Hamptons. Oh, what else? <laughs> what yes. else, right? Yes. I mean, because these are real, these are what the pianists really are like. Uh, you get mm -hmm. to see that. You get to see some people are actually, you know, nerdy. And some people are exceedingly entertaining. And somebody is Is it touching. actually ready to be uh, distributed? It's not quite yet ready because I uh, I'm overseeing the editing and and you know we have to uh, special effects uh, I mean not a lot of special so effects. How many but people are working on this? Just two, me and my co-producer. Oh, so it's Is a lot a, of hours. The other young man I have seen. Yes, yes. So you know, and I, of course I have to negotiate between my performance career. Uh, as a pianist, yeah. which is my full-time day job, uh -huh. and, you know, edit the show, be a TV producer, and, um, and I finished a movie where, you know, as an actor, uh, which is about to come out sometime in the fall, so I you have You finished sort of, a movie where you're an actor? Well, where I'm acting, I'm not what, sure, director you, or anything there. Did you produce it? No, no, I'm just acting. Hired. I was, yes, I'm what? just an actor. Oh, okay, it. don't keep us in the dark. I mean, you're <laughs> an actor also, and it comes out. Yes. And what, where did you finish that? Where was that Well, shot? it was shot in and around New York. It was shot um, in uh, Staten Island in New Jersey. Is it a commercial movie? It's a commercial independent action thriller. And it's called oh, Dishonorable. Are you a bad, bad guy I'm, in it? How did you guess that? <laughs> <laughs> I am just about the worst guy in it possible. Oh I'm um, I'm the murderous drug dealer who owns a nightclub. Oh I would say God. it's a typical typecasting. A typical <laughs> 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 so how did uh, I mean that that's all so we could talk about it for another yeah. half an hour. So that's very interesting. So you're a pianist, you're an actor, you're a producer, a filmmaker. Yeah. Do you cook? I do. As a matter of fact, I you like do. To cook? I like to cook. I cook very limited things. Yeah. That is to say, I love to cook fish and steak and uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. I don't bake. I don't do desserts. I don't do anything that oh, you requires have to hours come and back hours and to my hours. House for dessert. <laughs> <laughs> that I'll do gladly, as long as I don't have to bake it. Yeah. Um, no, you know, I don't. Um, I don't like to cook things that require mm. enormous preparation time and yeah. that, you know, take hours and thousands of ingredients. Um, I like very fast, streamlined, very health conscious things, but I like yeah. it. I actually like feeding people. I find yeah. this very uh, relaxing mm -hmm. and gratifying. So uh, you like doing this producing or acting, which you like better, making films or acting in the next movie well, you, you make you could be acting in it well you see I know I haven't I don't make movies that's the thing I I, I must say that when I saw how difficult it really is uh -huh. it is just the most I don't know thankless task really because they're 
the, everyone who's involved in making a film, you know, ultimately behind the scenes and people see the final product, they see the actors, they see the story, yeah. they don't realize that it's 30, 40 people working super hard for years, writing it, fine-tuning it, directing it, location, I mean, everything. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know, I didn't think about ever making a film for now, but you know, I night is young, who knows, maybe sometime <laughs> later on I will. No, I love acting. I, I, I always have, I um, f acted first in theater in Moscow years ago, and it really changed me as a musician because I, on the stage of the theater is where I really lost uh, the stage fright, the remnants of, you know, that usual thing that we're very susceptible to as musicians is that, will they like me? You know, am I, um, you know, am I going to forget my music? Am I going to stop in the middle of a piece? Those thoughts occur, occur to us all at some point. And I don't know, as an actor, I, um, I discovered a different kind of liberty on stage. Well, I have to tell you, when I watched you play, you don't only play, you act also. You don't just sit there and play. I mean, I could feel all the emotion. You move your body and you're swaying and you you put yourself into it. So it's, you are an actor. Oh, well, thank even you. Even when you play the piano. Well, my personal theory is that all musicians are actors. That we just don't yeah. have lines to say. We, we have to mime with our body in a very minimal way. Yeah. The message yeah. of the music. And we have yeah. to kind of reenact the storyline in our brain, yes. in our soul, heart, if you will, to make it connect to the audience. So I think every musician must take an acting course. I just got lucky because I, without taking a course, I just got cast, so I ended up doing it. But it's amazingly helpful, and it makes every musician a better musician, a better communicator, because acting is all about telling a story. As yeah. musicians, we're so focused on training and on the brilliance and on a you know, mastery of craft that I think storytelling not always comes to the foreground. I think we're sometimes so preoccupied with being perfect, with perfection, yeah. that we forget that all of this is a tool to touch someone's heart, to reach out to the audience and make them feel something. And that's what actors do by default. I mean, otherwise people leave the play or, or not right. watch a movie. So anyone in your family heard you uh, perform? Oh, yes. Um, well, of course, I was growing up, you know, my whole family having this pilgrimage to my concerts all the time. And then when I left, yes. that went away with me. So they are now very, um, very eager to hear me. Uh, and when, when they visit, my mother is actually coming to visit now for a month and a half. And she's going to hear me. And every time my sister comes or my dad or my mom, they overlap with some of my engagements. So I uh, always take them along. Are and they still in Russia? Yes, they live Everybody. in Moscow. Everybody? Yeah. Well, my uh, sister's engaged to somebody who lives in New York. So lucky uh, me, she's going to spend more time <laughs> here. But, um, you know, they, they love Russia. They have a wonderful time there. Russia is a wonderful country. I, I personally feel that... I was born there for a reason, and that part of Russia will always be in me and in my heart and in my soul. And of course. I don't know. I do have a connection to Russian literature and Russian music, actually now stronger than ever before. And I do think it's, you know, you can't avoid the fact that you were born there, but I'm happy here. I feel America is my home, New York City to be exact. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine living anywhere else. I miss America like I never missed any other place on earth. I mean, even when I'm in Paris, well, I Well, you get... belong with us. Yes. Did you hear me say us? I mean, I wasn't born here either. <laughs> but yes. I claim America, yeah. the USA, my country. Yes. But I still have my Hungarian heritage. Of course. Well, the beauty of this country is that it's made up of people who came from all over the world. And, yes. and the heritages of all these different cultures and countries come together yes. and produce something magical, which is right. this country. And, you know, today I think people, um, it's kind of in vogue 
to to be bashing the times. You know, times bad. Everything's bad, and you know, oh. and it's not the best time in history. But we mustn't forget that of all places in the world, this is still the place to be. This is still yes, a great country to live. Yes, and there were always times were bad. But of then people, times are good, and it's not all bad. You know, the thing that we have to remember when things are bad is not everything is bad. Yeah. And things will pass. Yeah. Well, we hardly have time to talk about your coming trip, uh, the coming trip, upcoming trip to Paris. Right. Well, I'm going to France to play the festival in Angoulême, uh, called Piano en Valois, and um, but that's a very short trip. And then I'm back, and I'm actually going to be in the city performing with my dear friend and amazing cabaret, Katie Sullivan, on November 11th. I heard that name. She is a star, mm. and yeah. she is uh, doing a marvelous show on November 11th, 11, 11, 11. And she just recently asked me if I would be a guest on her so I don't know yet what we're going to do, but I'm terribly Where? excited. It's going to be in the city. I can't really, possibly maybe Carlisle or maybe Algonquin. Um, mm -hmm. I'll let you know. I'll, I'll email you yes. because she is a sublime singer and actress, and she's just... So I think she comes out here to Guildhall. Yeah, at yeah, times. she's done, yeah, yes. she's been at, to, to Guildhall performing, and she's yes. just fantastic. So that, I'm looking forward to that a lot. And then, then I'm playing, uh, well, actually, before that, I'm playing in... Um, with Westmoreland Symphony, which is near Pittsburgh. I'm opening their season with Rahmanian of Third Concerto. And then I'm in California, and then I'm in Switzerland. I'm giving my Swiss debut in Bern this spring. So, and lots of exciting things. Well, it's been lovely, and I'm so sorry that everybody couldn't hear you play. <laughs> <laughs> next time. We want them to keep yes. coming next yes. time, right? I'll be back yes. next summer and then the summer after. <laughs> Judy, thank you so well, much for having me. We covered just about, we covered a lot, not, yeah. not enough, but it, we covered a good, good part. Yes, look, it's so it's wonderful. It's only a half you. hour, so you can only cover so much. Of course. No, look, we covered what we covered, but I think we've done really yes. well. Yes, yes. Thank you yeah, so much for having me. You're a good guest. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I'm going to talk to... Uh, set here. He's mm -hmm. the executive director that you'd like to submit your film here so they'll run it. Here. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It? The, when, it's, when it's done, absolutely. Yeah. I know our love will